welcome back. If you're joining us today here, welcome back online as well. Uh, you want to turn the page from where we are? We're going to start in Mark 5. I want to ask you a question. I just want to start out with kind of some thinking about our own lives. Uh, when you pray or when you, maybe you just checked in a few minutes ago and, and you texted generations to the, to the number and it says, you know, I get a thank you, Jeff, for checking in. How can we be praying for you, right? So you might type in a prayer request and then, you know, our elders and their wives and our staff and leaders, we, we pray for you. Right? When you do that, if you're going to submit a prayer request, or if you're to say what is, if you're to think of just what kind of what is your greatest need that you seek God for in prayer, what are those things? I know as we get the prayer requests, a lot of them right now are about COVID. People with COVID, COVID, the situation itself, the, uh, the politics of it, the health, the medical of it, the, just the implications of it, students and schools and just all these things, right? Um, there's a lot about that, and I just, I just think, I, I want to say, kind of on the heels of what Yvette said, thank you for being patient with us. Just thank you. Thank you that you're joining us online. Thank you that you're here. Thank you that we go online only uh, when, you know, kind of our leadership thinks, hey, it would be best, you know, if we did this. And we get ready to get back together uh, early this morning at a text message from someone who's been exposed to COVID, and you're just like, Ugh, Right? So maybe that's a part of your prayer request. You know, maybe it is life, relationships, situations, jobs, health, other health issues. There's still all the other health issues on top of COVID, right? Maybe it's those things. And let me just ask you this. If, if God were to answer your prayer, if God were to hear your prayer, he does. He hears your prayer. But if he were to give you what you asked for, if you had to answer your prayer in that way, to grant you what you're requesting, how would you respond to that? What would that cause you to do? Right? If he answered the very greatest prayer request you have, what kind of effect or change would that have in you? What would that cause you to do? I'm going to put this up this morning. Jesus the healer, that's what we're looking at today. Jesus healed people, delivered the oppressed, and raised to life those who died. If Jesus answered your greatest prayers today, what would be your response? How would you respond to that? right to jesus answering that prayer maybe you can even back up and kind of look at some recent prayer requests maybe your family's gone through covid you pray that they would all make it through maybe you've gone through changes in the last year things you've needed whatever it is that you're praying for you've prayed for those things in the last let's just say like three months and god meets you in those things answers your prayer there how did you respond how we respond when God answers our prayer, I think is important. And we're going to see that today in the passage. So Mark chapter 5, we're going to pick up in verse 1. It's nice to have some faces to see, by the way. When my jokes are dumb, I can look out and see the blank stares and know, okay, that was dumb. All right. When there's just a camera, I think I'm really funny. So. All right. Verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea. That would be the disciples and Jesus. To the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Now, I'm going to say this a lot, but there's that word again, right? Immediately, right? As we're reading through this, as we're teaching through this, if you're doing the daily readings, you get that text message and you read it, right? We're seeing that word repeated immediately. Mark's urgency is there in his writing. It's urgent in the way he gets this message out. Mark is an evangelist. He is taking Peter, who's an evangelist, he's taking his first-hand account of the gospel, and he is sharing it with primarily, Mark's audience is primarily non-Jewish people. And there is this urgency that they would respond to the message of Jesus. And so immediately, I think it's 36 times in the first 14 chapters of Mark, this urgent message so they get to the other side, and immediately there met him from the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. So there is a demon-possessed man who comes and meets Jesus. Verse 3, it says, he lived among, this is the, the demon-possessed man. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him, night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself 
with, with stones. Now listen to the description of this man. So we're told he has an unclean spirit, right? That something evil lives inside of him. Then we're told he is an outcast from society, lives among the tombs, lives where dead people live, right? Or where those who are uh, marginalized from culture, lepers, those who are there to die, those are put out there. People have tried to chain him up and bind him, but he breaks through that. And he's out there and he's so, so much turmoil and pain in his life, he's cutting himself with stones, right? Now, I don't know if you've encountered this, but there, there's a lot of what we call cutting today, young people especially, right? Who will cut themselves, they're trying to manage pain, manage things, there's something they can control in that. Everything else is out of control. There's something, there's something they can cause. There's a cause and effect. It's not healthy. I mean, just hearing that, you know, if you want to cause something, cause something good. Don't cause more pain, right, in an already painful life. But that's not how it works out. People are struggling through this. There's this sense of that, that there's a release there, right? Listen to the struggles of this man. How society has pushed him away. How their answers have been kind of chain him up, but that didn't work, right? He's cutting himself. He's in deep oppression. This is a, a troubled life. If we just look at the description we're given of him. Verse 6, it says, And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. So what does this deeply oppressed man want? When he comes to Jesus, what is his need, his want? My guess is he wants to be free from this pain and torment, right? We don't have that kind of conversation with him. Like we don't get to interview him like, what did you want? And what did you say? You know, we get the story that we're given. But it's pretty simple to assume he wants freedom from this oppression, freedom from this pain, freedom from the struggle that he is in, right? Verse 7. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, what do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. Now, there's a conversation happening with a man, but he's possessed by a demon. We're really hearing this demon now speak to Jesus, right? Verse 8, for he was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. So we know this is who is responding to Jesus. Verse 9, and Jesus asked him, what's your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. So the demon cries out to Jesus. Jesus responds and talks to him. This is a bit of a confusing passage. We don't get a lot of these. There is more, let's say, demon activity, or, or there's more evil present in the four books of the gospel. So there's more evil present, basically, spiritual evil, that we see in the three years of the vocational ministry of Jesus' life than we see in all the rest of Scripture combined. It's like this center, it's like ground zero for spiritual attack is right there as Satan himself knows Jesus is there, right? And it seems like, like evil is present in a way that is not common to us today or, or in any time that we read about in Scripture. And so this man comes out desiring relief from this. He goes to Jesus, and then Jesus goes to speak to the evil, the evil spirit and, and tell him to leave the man. And there's actually a short conversation. And in that, Jesus asks the demon, what's your name? And he says, Legion, we are many. There's lots in there. You think you have struggles in life, right? This guy's going through it. Now, again, I don't mean you don't have struggles in life. But imagine these struggles just for a minute. And if yours feel equally weighty, then man, we love you. Right? And we're sorry, and we want to pray, and we want to walk with you. But most of us, when we hear this, think, okay, I guess it could be worse. Right? Like, my struggles are big, but then I look at this, and I'm like, okay, not that big. Right? And so we're not comparing. Right? We don't compare my struggles to your struggles and rate how they are. My wife and I, we always say, you know, your worst is your worst. I mean, like, whatever you're going through that's bad and hard and hurts and is your struggle, and it's your worst, it's your worst. Right? There's no... Well, your worst isn't as good as this worst or as bad as this worst or whatever. But let's just be honest. This guy's going through it, right? There's a lot happening here. He's completely marginalized from culture. They don't know how to handle him, so he lives on the outside in the tombs, right? They've tried to chain him up. That didn't work, but that was culture's answer for him. Let's lock this dude up, and, and that didn't work. 
He's tormented. He's in so much pain that he's cutting himself. It's not just one demon, but it's many. Even as Jesus does this, there's like this dialogue. This is just a crazy, crazy setting. Just a very hard setting to listen to. Verse 10. And he, meaning the man, uh, the demon, excuse me, begged him earnestly not to send them, the demons, out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him, saying, send us in the pigs, let us enter them. So he, Jesus, gave them, the demons, permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. This is one of the more confusing verses in Mark, if you ask me. Right? There's this engagement with demons. There's like a, a conversation, right, which is really weird. There's this, please don't send us out of the country, which I don't understand necessarily. And there's like, send us into the pigs. Okay. <laughs> they go to the pigs, and then they drown the pigs. So this isn't ever really explained. And, and I know there are whole streams of churches that kind of run with this. And I would just say... We don't know much more than that. Never do we get another story like this to help us define anything. Like, there's no, like, spiritual warfare playbook, necessarily, that deals with things like this. This is an odd circumstance, but it takes place. It's captured for us that we might see, I think, for me, that the only thing I'd really come up with is that we can see the, the volume of trouble that this guy's enduring. Now, the rest of it and the, and the poor pigs, I don't know, right? I like bacon. That's as far as I go, right? But what we see is a man who's been just oppressed by this level of evil. And then we see him liberated from that by Jesus. Right? That's a story for us. I'm not sure there's more there for us today. But in that, we can find ourselves in this story and just... Listen to this man who's been delivered from that. Verse 14. The herdsmen fled and told the city, and told it in the city, told the story in the city, and in the country, and the people came out to see what was happened. Can you imagine, right? This is the story they go back to. The guys who own the pigs go tell the people in the city, this is what happened, and they come out to see Jesus. I imagine they do. What do you think those people from the city, told by the herdsmen, about this story, about Jesus delivering this oppressed man from their, we'll say from their community, but he's been pushed out of their community, that then takes over these pigs and runs them into, and drowns them in the water. What do you think that crowd came out to see? Probably a show, right? I mean, probably they came out to see this guy they hear about who did this fantastic, extraordinary thing, right? But they come out to see this. Sometimes I, I think our prayer life turns into this sense of like, maybe just like see what happens. Maybe, maybe in this we're like, I wonder what Jesus will do in this circumstance. I think we can kind of see ourselves maybe even in that crowd as they come out more inquisitive, more wondering, very different than the man who comes running from the tombs and bows down to Jesus, like, hey, set me free, right? Verse 15, and they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion sitting there clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. I love that verse about the man, or that line about the man. He's clothed and in his right mind. Well, what a blessing. Well, what a story from the beginning where we're told all these things all the way up to him cutting himself and, and his kind of being ostracized from culture and the, the things that have taken place that other people have done to him, trying to constrain him. And then we get this image of him clothed and in his right mind. It's a powerful contrast from the beginning to now. You see, the gospel message kind of sits right in there. That there's a God who created us and loves us, designed us, made us how we are to be. That our lives are designed to be those who give glory to God. That we would worship God with every decision, with every word, with every breath, with every choice, with every relationship, with every gathering. That we would give glory to God in all those things. 
And we all know we've broken that design. That by sin, meaning I choose my way instead of God's way. That by sin, we've broken that relationship and, and done damage to the design of me giving glory to God with everything that I do, with every breath that I have. And that that sin is, has been going on since the beginning of humanity. And with each of those sins, the world is just weighted down with brokenness. And then we fast forward to this man and we see the outcome of sin in the world, evil in the world. And we see this man and he's just oppressed. It may not be his sin or his family's sin or his community's sin, but it's sin in the world, right? It's the broken world that we live in. This, this man, he wasn't like this because that's how God made the world. He's like this because that's how we made the world. That's sin. And the gospel story is that Jesus enters into this broken and flawed, oppressed by evil, harm, just hurtful, hard world. And he enters into it like us. He comes in in flesh. He comes in fully human, still remaining fully God, a mystery bound up in our Savior. And he lives this life that we live, endures our struggles, but without sin. And then he will go to the cross to give to pay the penalty for our sin, our problems, our wrongdoing. He will be beaten on our behalf, betrayed, and dies. He resurrects from the grave to give us a new life, that, that we could live in a different world, in a different way than we had. And that we can live a transformed life. And, and here's a snapshot. We say that all the time. Here's just a picture for you. Before Jesus, this man was oppressed by evil, outcast of culture and society. He was just completely demonized, right? He was just oppressed by these demons, and he is living out in the tombs, cutting himself because of the pain he lives in. And then Jesus, so we'll do the but Jesus, right? But the gospel, but the life and, and death and, and resurrection, all those things that Jesus does for us. And then we get to see this man impacted by Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. It's a power, powerful image of a, a redeemed or a reconciled life because of Jesus. He's once over here, and now we see him, and it says clothed, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. For me, that's such a powerful line about the transforming work of Jesus. Here's how Peter says it in 1 Peter 5. He says, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. There's a promise for this life and a promise forever. This restore, confirm, strengthen, establish. The gospel does that, that it restores us, that it confirms us, that it brings us into Christ. Not that we have to wonder. That it establishes us in Christ and begins to transform us in Christ. There are some things that might look immediately, uh, look immediate like this man. And there's some things that may take time. Those are those ongoing things we've been praying about for a while, right? Or there's those things like when you come to faith, there's actual transformation that takes place in that moment that we've all experienced. If you're in Christ, you've experienced that transformation. And there's this man sitting there clothed and in his right mind. Verse 16. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. I don't know if it's the loss of pigs. I don't know if it's the fear of Jesus. I don't know what it is. But they begin to beg Jesus to leave. It's an interesting response. Verse 18, and he was getting into the boat. As he was getting in the boat, Jesus, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. Here's the man's response. He begs Jesus that he can remain with him. Right? That's a powerful response of, of who we should be when Christ has, has met us, who has met our needs. I asked a question like, what are the things, the greatest things you're praying for? And if, and if God answered that prayer, how would you respond? Well, here's his response. He wants to remain with Jesus. He wants to get in the boat and go travel with Jesus. So here's a note for you. The oppressed man delivered, tormented and possessed man who cut himself and lived in the tombs now clings to Jesus. The outcome of this miracle is a deep desire to be with Jesus. Is this our response when Jesus meets our needs that we take to him in prayer.
Does it drive us to this deep longing to be with Jesus, to spend more time with Jesus? Verse 19, and he did not permit him to, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and everyone marveled. So here's the, here's the command of Jesus. There's what the man wants, which isn't what Jesus wants for him. Here's the command of Jesus. He says this, go tell your friends, tell them how much the Lord has done for you. Go share your story with others, right? Go tell your story to the people. And so he goes out to the 10 cities, the Decapolis. Uh, this is probably the first miracle Jesus does among non-Jewish people. And so he sends him out. This man was known, right? When, the, when, when he was pushed away outside of culture, he'd been tried to have been constrained by culture, by, by the community, didn't work. Go tell your story. And he obeys. He says he went away and began to proclaim how much Jesus had done for him. When God meets us, when Jesus meets us in our prayers, is our response to listen to what Jesus wants and then obey? Do we do what he has called us to do? Here's a note for you. From healing to obedience, the man Jesus delivers from pain and suffering responds in obedience to Jesus. Is a new level of obedience our response when Jesus answers our prayers? The man wants to cling to Jesus. Do we do that? When Jesus gives us direction, do we respond in obedience? Or do we forget how important that prayer was to us that we prayed and spent time seeking Jesus for? Verse 21. And when Jesus crossed again into the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, seeing him, fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So Jairus, a religious leader, they're back in Jewish territory. Now it's a Jewish religious leader. says, I have a daughter who's dying. Jesus, will you come make her well? So here's his prayer. Jesus, will you come make her well? I don't want to lose my daughter. That's what he wants in this moment. Verse 24, and he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. So what does the crowd now want from Jesus? What, what are they looking for? There's this, oftentimes there's this crowd about him that seem to not be there for the same things. We saw this crowd across the way, across the water, and they want to hear the story. They want to see the amazing things. But then when they're confronted with that, they, try, they send Jesus away like, hey, I don't know what this is, but you've got to go. They're not there for the same thing. Not there for the same thing the possessed man was. Or, or Jairus now. We see this crowd following along. Verse 25. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. She has a bleeding disorder. A long, long health problem. Verse 26. Who had suffered much under many physicians. And had spent all that she had. It was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch his garments, even his garments... I will be made well. What does the woman want from Jesus? She wants to be made well, right? She has a long health issue, a long-standing bleeding disorder that she's gone to doctors, she spent all her money on, she's tried to take care of this and, and has heard of Jesus and she wants to bring this to Jesus and, and she wants Jesus to take this struggle from her. Verse 29, and immediately the, oh, I missed, there we go. So, even I touch his garments, I will be made well. Verse 28, verse 29. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? This picture of that crowd, right? The crowd's all pressing in on him, right? It's paparazzi. He's trying to get through the crowd. They're pressing in. And a woman touches him. Like, everybody's probably bumping into him. But this woman, with faith, by faith, touches him for healing. She does something different than the crowd. The crowd is pressing in. It's just pressing in. They're probably pressing in for them. It's a curiosity. It's a sightseeing. It's kind of see a show, right? What will he do today? I heard about the last day. It was off the hook. We want to see what he does today. That's not why the woman's there. That's not what she's there to see Jesus about. She's there that he might make her well. 
Verse 32, and he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. I know her, I love her response. She's afraid to answer the question. Not sure why. But as Jesus asks it, she is confronted with, I'm healed by him. I want to tell him the truth. Here's a note for you. The woman heals. Jesus heals a woman suffering, and then she overcomes her fears and speaks to Jesus. Nothing will stop her from knowing her healer more deeply. Her fears aren't going to get in the way of her answering Jesus' question. Because whatever happened, it happened, and she knows it's real. She felt the transformation inside of her. And Jesus asked this, and, and her fear creeps up, like, can I do something wrong? What happened? Or what is he going to say? Or what's going to, you know, what's going to go on here? And there's a lot culturally. The clean and unclean in Judaism, and, and just there's a lot of things there. There's a lot of things that would prevent her or cause her a fear or an intimidation of answering him. But how can she not? This thing that has defined her life for the last dozen years is now gone. How can she not speak up? How can she not hear and answer, respond to the one who healed her? Verse 34, and he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Of the comfort and kindness. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace, be healed of your disease. Verse 35, while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? So someone comes to tell Jairus, hey, I know you went to go get Jesus, and I know you guys are kind of on the way, but it's too late. So your daughter has already died. Verse 36, but overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. Now just consider this. You've been told your daughter died. What you came to see Jesus about that ship in your mind has sailed, right? We don't have a big paradigm for people coming back from the dead, right? And, and so she's died. It's kind of over with. What do you do? But Jesus says, don't worry about it. Just have faith. Like, do you still trust in Jesus who is a little too late to get to your house to help your daughter? Do you overcome everything you know about life and death in this moment to trust in Jesus? And, and maybe... Maybe you just long so much to not lose your daughter, you try anything. What does he do in that moment? Verse 37, he allowed no one to follow him, Jesus. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house where the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, peeping, people weeping and wailing loudly. Right? This is a setting of great pain, mourning. She's died, and they're suffering. They're hurting in this moment. Verse 39, and when he had entered... He said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. Can you even imagine how that question landed in that room right then? They've lost this little girl. She's dead. I know it's a long time ago, but they still know what dead is, right? Dead isn't a question mark. Every person dies. They know what this is. And they walk in, and this guy that was kind of their last hope, the one that Jairus goes to get doesn't show up in time, and she dies. She's dead. They've sent word to him. Don't worry about it. She's just sleeping. Can you just imagine the people? Verse 40, and they laughed at him. Of course they did. What he just said was crazy. Unless you're Jesus. But he put them all outside, and he took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. And taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. There's two more uses of that word immediately. He speaks, and immediately she gets up, and she begins walking. It says they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly, he, Jesus, strictly charged them that no one should know this. And he told them to give her something to eat. There are stories throughout the Gospels that teach us of Jesus healing the sick, liberating the oppressed, spiritually or otherwise. 
literally raising the dead. And what we need to see oftentimes is their response. In the case of this little girl, she immediately gets up like everything is different now. She begins walking. They begin to serve. They're, they're, they're amazed. This, this has changed everything for them. We see this in the man. This man who's been oppressed and pushed out. And we see him sitting there, dressed, and in his right mind. And all he wants to Jesus, can I just stay with you? Can I go with you? I just want to hang out. Everything is different. I want more of you. He says, no, I want you to go back. I want you to tell others. I want you to tell the community you live in what I've done for you. And he does it. He's obedient. He goes back. The woman that's healed, she overcomes her fears and responds to Jesus. The, the little girl gets up immediately. And the crowd, the house, the mourning people, the people suffering and grieving are amazed by Jesus. When we pray to Jesus, when we're seeking something from Jesus, and Jesus meets us in that moment, what is our response? In fact, when we go to prayer, when we go to pray about something, when we're praying for something, what do we expect our response should be? And again, maybe it's easy to answer that and sound spiritual and like a Christian and answer it the right way to sitting here. But back up. Just back up a little bit to the last time you prayed for something big. God, my whole family's sick with COVID. Will you, will you get us through this? God, we've lost a loved one. Will you meet us in this? God, I'm alone. I'm struggling. I'm without a job, a home. And when Jesus met you in that, what was your response? Did it drive you deeper into your faith? Did it cause you to want to spend more time with Jesus? Or did you go kind of like the crowd and, and get the answer and not let it affect you? Maybe even got the answer and walked away. What do you do? What do I do? What do we do when we seek Jesus in prayer? Do we treat it like these people treated it? Do we show up there with faith? Do we expect an answer from Jesus? And when we get that answer, when Jesus meets us in that moment, how do we respond? Because we tend to go into prayer like everything is riding on this answer. Like, I need this, whatever this is. But when we get that, do we treat the one who gave it to us as if he is the end all, be all, do all for us? Do we allow that to transform our lives and press us deeper into our faith? Will you pray with me? Jesus, we love you. I know there are things I've prayed for, we're still praying for. And I know that you have met me in some moments. And you have changed my life. I know that sometimes I pray for things and, and I might just be going through the motions. I might not be thinking about the implications. I'm just praying. I know sometimes you meet me in answers and do things and, and I haven't always pressed in. I don't always respond with a new level of faith or obedience or even of worship and wanting your presence. All throughout scriptures, we see people where you imagine just, um, uh, just miraculously meet with them. As we studied Exodus not too long ago, how you would encounter the people, do the miraculous with people, and they would just walk away and forget. Lord, help us. Help us to know why we're praying. Help us to pray with faith, with belief, with, with trust in you. And help us that when we receive an answer, when you meet us in that moment, let it be transformative. Let it be life-changing. Let us remember that we sought you, oftentimes with tears and longing for an answer. And when we get that, let that drive us near to you. Let it overcome our fears of following you. Let us listen for your response and obey your response. If it's be with you, draw near to you, great. If it's go tell others about you, let us be obedient. 
if it's just get up and walk and show the world, then let us do that. But let us look to you in new ways each time you meet with us. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.